Colleen McKay was a stockbroker in her early 20s in an alpha male dominated industry. Marginalized, looked over, and even dismissed by her colleagues, she refused to submit to these perceptions. She worked hard to move up the ladder and to win respect from both her teammates and her clients. One by one, she brought quality clients to her brokerage only to find herself in a situation where through no fault of her own, the brokerage had failed, leaving her in the middle of a heated and messy legal battle. Now, Colleen is not the type of person to ignore responsibility, so she showed up each day to guide her clients while others in her company hid under a rock. But it gets even worse for her, much worse. And I can't wait for you to hear her incredible personal power, how she rises back up, and how she uses those skills now to help real estate agents and entrepreneurs overcome their challenges. Her approach through neuro-linguistic programming is hailed by some as therapeutic magic. They can also claim that NLP can model the skills of exceptional people by allowing anyone to acquire them. You'll be inspired by Colleen's story. I'm completely amazed by Colleen's resilience and professionalism and by the quality of the tools that she used to pull herself up out of an extreme low. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Okay, well, welcome from Canada. Tell me where where are you at? So I am just north of Toronto. I'm in a little cul-de-sac, literally. I was born and raised here, married a guy that's from here as well. So put down the roots, probably will never leave, but it's an area called Bradford. So pretty growing in, in Ontario. It's one of the largest growing communities, but also still has its very small town feel to it. Love it. So I want to know about Canadian life a little bit, because um, I don't have a ton of experience with Canadian folk, although all the experience I have has been very positive. Um, I was one time the sales manager of a real estate development, and one of the things that we did to kind of set ourselves apart or make us a little bit more competitive is that we would leave our open our pool early and we would leave it open a little bit longer. So Mm -hmm. in Missouri, the United States, the, you know, the season for the summer season is, you know, pretty much june july august and so we would try to open up our pool in may a little bit and then we would keep it open until october which is cold like to give you an idea it's 27 degrees here today you know i feel bad for kids trick-or-treating because like it's either 90 degrees or 30 degrees in october i don't know what it's like but i i would stepped out of my office and it was right around this time of year it was mid to late october and we hadn't got around to closing the pool down yet which is dangerous because you don't want it to freeze and there was these these people swimming in the pool, like bouncing up and down, having a great time. And I kind of stepped outside and, and I had an odd reaction where I just kind of like leaned in and was like, who are these people in this freezing water? And they kind of said, hey, it's OK. We're Canadian. Like, don't worry. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, I get it. No problem. So what is what is life like in Canada growing up in Canada? So in Canada, it's actually not that dissimilar. So we just came from a spell of really warm weather, not not quite as warm as Missouri, but we were in the 19 and 20 degree range all of last week. However, and up to yesterday, however, today we are high of four, low of minus two. So it's a pretty big pendulum swing. There's been weeks where we've been at 15 degrees and then the next day been at minus three. And then there's been weeks where we were hitting record highs. So I think about three weeks ago, we were in a record high where we were pushing 29 degrees. And so that's really warm for October in Canada. Like that, that was heat wave territory. But it's usually in and around the end of October when things are starting to get pretty cold. Mid to late September, things start to dip into like the mid to low teens and then progressively getting more. Where we get really cold is February. That's when it's absolutely freezing. Uh, Same kind of seasons here where May, June is when people, if we've got a really warm May, May, June is when people start to open up the pools and then try to suck out as much of the summer as possible because we do get some pretty fierce winters here. That's for sure, especially here. And what I've heard is it's not so much about the weather, it's about the gear that you have. So any kind of weather is okay as long as you have the gear. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about life growing up in Canada. So it was, I have to say, I had a pretty great life growing up here. Um, like I said, the town that I'm from, pretty small net community, lots of tightness amongst it. 
you know, the place that I'm from is also a little bit of a farming community. So there's a place called the Holland Marsh that is internationally known. It's one of the great growing areas, especially it's in the grapes. Uh, grapes? So grapes are actually the Niagara region, which is okay. about an hour and a half to two hours away from me. But we're, we're really well known for growing carrots. So, oh, gotcha. Oh, you said a great growing, uh, yeah, a great growing, growing area. I thought you said grape growing area, which was <laughs> odd for me because I thought grapes needed hot weather. So yes. carrots, carrots do good in cold weather, though, apparently. Absolutely. And you want to know what's so funny is my town's mascot is Gwilly the Carrot. So that's how farming community we are. Um so yeah, it was a really great small, small town community growing up, tight knit. I have friends that I was friends with when I went into high school that we're still friends with. I'm not going to age myself too much, sure. but it's a couple of decades later and we're still very close. Our kids grew up together. So it's really nice. And growing up in Canada also is really nice. You know, I think every country has its benefits and then, of course, its drawbacks. And anyone who looks at the news definitely has seen some of the Canadian drawbacks as of late. But overall, I think that I'm very lucky to have grown up in Canada because I've gotten all of those benefits that have been so closely at my fingertips. And, you know, getting all of the different seasons as well. I definitely am more opposed to the summer and spring months. Those are what I prefer. I, mean, I don't like being cold, so I'm constantly brought up in sweaters and blankets, especially because I do work from home um, in the winter time, and I don't love to go out. But on the occasion, I do like to get out and do some of the winter sports. So in the past, I've snowboarded, I've skied before. I haven't horse, I, I, I haven't um, snowshoe. That's something I do need to do. I, I want to give that a try. But it's pretty lucky to get to have all of the four seasons and experience it all throughout one year. So I gotta say I'm pretty lucky getting to live here. Sounds like you're pretty pleased. And yeah. so I've noted a few things already. So you don't get out much and you have deep <laughs> relationships from high school. So that tells me you're an introvert and you really like deep conversations. I do love deep conversations. Um, I'm an extrovert introvert. So I am, I'm really a chameleon. It depends on the situation. Okay. I really do love being in a tight group and talking about things that really matter. I also really love observing people. One of my favorite things to do is to go out in public and just watch people. And I know how creepy it sounds. I actually do recognize how creepy it sounds, but I love to just see how people are interacting, see how people move and live their daily lives. And then to also think about like, I wonder what their life is about. I wonder a lot whenever I meet new people. And that's one of the things that I love. That's why I'm an introvert extrovert is because I love meeting new people. I love going to a new place and having a new group of people that I can ask them about themselves, find out who they are, why they are the way they are, what their experiences were like growing up as well, where they came from, what they do and why they do it. So that's the extrovert side of myself. And then I also love being on stage too. I grew up um, doing something called Irish dancing. I actually competed internationally. So from five years old, all the way up into my 20s, I actually toured with a dance troupe too. So I'm used to being out and about and kind of performing in a way. If you think is this about like uh, like river dance dancing? Yes, absolutely. That is Just like that. It is. Yeah. Okay. Extremely difficult and um, you know taxing. Did it take you a long time to learn how to do that? So I learned at a young age. So I started dancing when I was five, and I was one of those dancers that I was really really good, or I was really really bad. Like. Some years I would win the Canadian championships mm. and then some years I would be pressed even place at a regular competition. Um, so it was a very interesting learning curve for me because I naturally had talent, like from a physical standpoint, I naturally had good muscle memory. I had the right physical makeup to be able to do both the hard and the soft shoe dancing. But as a young person, my brain was everywhere. I had trouble concentrating. I had trouble remembering my steps. I, my dance teachers would always tell me like, 
I needed to just go into autopilot and dance so that I could dance well, because if I was dancing and I was thinking, I would dance terribly. And I was Mm. also one of those dancers where literally anything that could happen did happen. So I was at a national championship once and it was in, uh, I think it was in Nashville. I was dancing at the Grand Ole Opry. And as I was dancing, um, if you've seen River Dance, you'll see sometimes we do like kickups. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had my dance shoe had come undone and I could feel it slipping off. And when oh, no. I did the leg kick up, my shoe literally flung up, hit the chandelier and then landed directly on the judge's table. Wow. So, that's like a weapon. That's yeah. that's those shoes. They're probably heavy shoes too. Like, yeah. So li- literally to say, cause the hard shoes have the thick, the thick top and the thick heel. So needless to say, caught a lot of attention. Everybody was kind of talking about it. Like, oh my God, did you see that? Like, it was a funny thing at the same time. I mean, me as the dancer who had happened to, because obviously I wasn't getting any points for that. Um, It was embarrassing. It was upsetting because I had trained very hard to get there and I didn't get disqualified, but I definitely did not place well in that round. So it it was a solo performance. Not yes, like in a was. group. Okay. Yeah. I did a lot of solo. I did do some group, but mostly solo was my competition. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how a lot of times we we remember our, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to call it a failure, but it's more, more of a fluke. You know, those things that happen that we have no control over, um, you, you we remember it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's such a compelling story because that's kind of what happens. You know, we're going along, we plan for the best, and then all of a sudden a wheel falls off the wagon, and now we're left to make a decision. And it's in those decisions that really sort of define us. So, like, what? how were you defined after that incident? So, it, because it was things that happened to me so often, my dance teacher literally once told me, like, if I had, if I didn't have bad luck, I'd have no luck. And that's mm. been something that's kind of followed me. It made me have to learn resilience because I had to be able to compartmentalize things from a young age and still be able to perform at my height. And that was hard because, you know, that probably happened to me. I want to say maybe I was about 13 or 14 when that specifically happened to me. But for every one of those stories, there's hundreds of others of different things that have happened throughout my life that have been similar type of things. I'm at the peak performance. I'm really trying to achieve great things. And then something completely takes me off path and really makes me have to exercise resilience, compartmentalization, and then be able to reframe and redirect into a new direction. And sometimes it's a similar direction. And sometimes it's a completely different direction as a result, but it really has scoped who I became doing that type of sport because it required me to perform at a very high level and to be able to be basically a showman be able to get on stage i remember um i was i think maybe 16 or 17 at the time and literally right before a nationals my grandfather passed away literally days before we were to fly out for the nationals he passed away and i had to compete we weren't going to cancel the trip because it was a very expensive trip i'd been training for like 6 months and i had to go and i had to compete and that was you know a further lesson of how you have to be able life doesn't wait for you you have to be able to move forward in a way to still achieve the goals that you want and the things that you desire while still carrying the burden of other things that have happened in your past and learning how to create um create harmony between the two let's talk about that for a second and i know what you're talking about because in my 20s i was a performer i was a paid actor, you know, it's kind of a, uh, there's a distinction there, you know, between an actor and a paid actor. I think my, um, my college guidance counselor told me when I chose acting and performance as a major, he goes, are you sure this is what you want to do? And I said, yeah, I just, I, I was guided in that direction. It was the only thing that I was really constantly getting affirmed for. I had no other real skills. I wasn't, I didn't love the attention. I just loved the joy that I created and making someone laugh or I loved the craft of creating a character and, and all of the things that go behind that. I'm at my core, 
I'm really an artist that has had to cope with real life. And my coping skills are very, very high. And so I understand what you mean by compartmentalizing uh, trauma or compartmentalizing those derailing events that happened to you. And I want to talk about that in more depth. But I would say you're right that a, a lot of times when we're performing, and this transfers in business and it transfers in sales, because in a way, those are performances. I mean, you have to be on. There's a certain level of energy that is required of a performer that most people will never understand. Um, there's also a, a, a duty to focus on the performance that a lot of people don't give performers credit for. And this is what you're talking about by needing to be laser beam focused, regardless of the emotional things or physical things that are happening in your life staying in character yeah. regardless of external stimulus right is a skill because most people just want to give up they want to stop they want to start over but we can't do that in life we have to just kind of continue on and get through the scene and then evaluate afterwards that's not an easy skill for people and so i just wanted to commend you for being able to do those things and, and it gives you the authority to coach people and to kind of have out of body experiences when you're coaching people so that you can kind of coach people in a holistic 360 way and I know that's what you do. Um, let's talk about um, some of the things that so let's go into the into the compartmentalizing. So how has compartmentalizing helped you move forward through difficult situations? So I started off when I was 21 as a stockbroker, I literally, I, I originally went to school for marketing and advertising. I thought I was going to become an art director. And so I went into the industry. I was in there for about six months because I fast tracked. So I came out of school pretty burnt out, fast tracked, started working, found out I really didn't like what it was all about. And I ended up becoming a stockbroker. Um, was that a difficult like learning process? Was it a lot of tests? And I mean, I know in the U.S. Yeah. there's a lot of like exams that you have to pass and it's a very highly competitive like alpha yeah. male sales environment. Was it the oh, same yeah. for you? Oh, yes. Yeah. So okay. much so. So wow. and especially because when I got my first job in it, I specialized in the mining sector. So I was working for a very prolific family in Canada and they had like they were they were in history for the mining sector. And so it was an old boys club and it good in bad ways. It was an old boys club. So I would go to what we used to call was the dog and pony shows. And it would be these really fancy lunch meetings where there'd be 20 to 30 other brokers there. And we would be sitting there and they would tell us their story about the mine or, and it, there's a lot of other different companies that I went to presentations for, not just mining. But what was the purpose of the dog and pony shows? Were you trying to get clients or were they training you how to be a better stockbroker? they were actually trying to get us to buy their stock. So okay. at these events, they would tell us a story about the stock because they wanted analysts to follow them. So there'd be analysts there that were there. They would want the stockbrokers to include it in their client portfolios. There was some, um, we do flow through in Canada as well. It's a, it's a tax, um, it's a tax tool, tax mitigation tool. So they would want us to buy their flow through shares as well. So there was a lot of different reasons why we would be invited to go there, but it was always the intent was for us to buy their stock, support their stock, participate. Okay. And They're so, selling you on their company so that exactly. you can go sell their stock. Gotcha. Exactly. So when I would go there, I would be probably one of three females there. And keep in mind, I was 21 when I started. So the females that were there were usually in their mid 40s to late 50s. So they were in some ways almost double my age. Can you describe them somewhat? <laughs> like what were they like? Like were they were they um, effective, quality hardened? Had they changed? Do you think Hard. had they um, yeah. compromised, so or were they just powerful? Describe them a, a little bit. So the first word that came to mind was hard. Now I'm not saying that in a bad way though. They mm -hmm. definitely were powerful because these women to be able to still be in that space, especially back then, mm -hmm. and still be you know thriving there 
they had to be very powerful women. The woman that mentored me, her name was Pauline Hawthorne. And oh my God, I used to call her mama bear. Um, she was very much one of those women. She was the COO of the brokerage that I worked for and the CFO. She held two titles and she was just such a resilient woman because she'd been in the industry. She used to work for a couple of major companies in Canada as well throughout her history. She dealt with the guys that belittled her. She dealt with not having, you know, a place at the table. She made her place at the table. And so there were women who were definitely hardened by it, but they were effective and they were strong. Funny thing was, is that because I was 21 and I was coming in, it's not like they just automatically gave me respect. They kind of looked at me actually like, oh, you know, kind of felt bad for me at the same time, but then very, very few of them were willing to help because they had fought so hard to get there themselves that they didn't want to, I guess, they didn't want to um, separate their focus by mentoring somebody, but Pauline did, and she was amazing. So she really, really molded who I was back then. And it was so funny. She She would always give me the advice. She's like, get as licensed as you can and learn as much as you can, and then keep moving up. And that was that mentality, because you knew, you know, when I was at these lunches, I'd be in the room of the other three females, all of the men that were there. There, It was really funny. There would be a very older group of gentlemen, and there is a, a, there's a couple of gentlemen who would always kind of, not fight, but like, kind of be like, oh, you're going to come and sit beside me today. And it was almost like they wanted to like protect me kind of mm-hmm. from the situation. Cause I mean, I'm sure you recognize there are certain industries that do carry negative connotations about them sure. and what they kind of look at females like, and that it has, it, you know, it, it really has gentrified. It's getting better, but back then. Stockbrokers is one of those professions, right? Yeah, absolutely. I was just mm-hmm. a little piece of meat back then to a lot of them. Look, to look. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very interesting because I really recognized, cause my job was also to bring in clientele as well. I needed to build out my own portfolio and I really recognized that I was going to probably have difficulty because first off, who that is a high net worth individual is going to look at a 21 year old and be like, oh yeah, here's a million dollars. No problem. Like that was a limiting belief that I had. That I had to overcome. I was very lucky that the brokerage that I was at, they did give me a lot of opportunity. The owner of the brokerage would throw me deals here and there. And I also did a lot of research for the company as well. So I ended up actually um, getting some really good information for him that helped him win a lawsuit. So there was definitely some wins. And it really taught me the foundation of learning communication. Because I was dealing, like I said, with all of these people who were far older than me. And they were already looking at me like, oh my God, she looks baby faced. Like how old is she? What life experience does she really have? Kind of thing. So there was a lot of limiting beliefs that were being imposed on me. And there was probably some truth to it too. When you look back on your 21 year old self and when I do, I see how arrogant that I was and how much I thought I knew the world, but it's like that gave me the confidence to go into places that I'd never thought I was um, qualified to be. And in fact, I did go to places that I wasn't qualified to be and learned fast. Um, But at the same time, um, the fact that you were there yeah, means that you were qualified to be there in your own mind. And I love the confidence that you had. And so did you, um, what was your overall feelings waking up every day? Were you putting on your clothes and like your shoes and saying, oh, I got to go to this environment again and like deal with all this? Or were you just like, no, I'm focused on the work or I'm focused on the learning? Like, where was your focus during this time? Both the work and the learning. Trust me, there was definitely times where I'm like, oh, but everyone has those periods of time. Mm -hmm. Sure. And those are normal. And those are actually what scopes the motivation. I would get up every morning because with that, with the advice that Pauline gave me, get as licensed as you can, 
do as many exams as you can, like get as many under your belt as possible. So I started off and I, I was very fortunate. I, well, fortunate and unfortunate. My commute was two hours door to door. I took a train to work. Wow. So for four hours each day, I had the ability to study and I did. And so I fast tracked going through all of the licensing and I ended up actually taking a couple of additional courses as well, because I did want to get as licensed as possible. So I did options and derivatives and I kept going with my licensing because to me, the path to success was going to become one of the more knowledgeable people in the room because I did, I lacked the experience. I hadn't you know, I hadn't had the worldly experience. I hadn't been in the industry for 20 years and knew what it was like to participate in a flow through right off the hop. Like it was all going to be new to me. But as long as I knew a lot of information, I knew that I could position myself as a knowledgeable source. And so that's what I really focused in on doing. And it really did help me. And that's kind of when my my sales journey began, because I like I said, I was responsible to try and find my own clients, you know, going to your friends and family when you're 21 years old and being like, hey, guys, can you give me your portfolio and I'll trade for you? They're like, oh. uh, now fast forward to today, we've got, you know. 17 year olds that are trading on the stock market and absolutely killing it. So it's a different world. But back then I was like, okay, I'm going to need to learn to become a better communicator and salesperson as well, so that I can actually communicate what I've learned and convince people that I know my shit. That's exactly right. So, I mean, I had the exact same sort of experience when I started real estate, I was 30 years old and Mm -hmm. the average age of the real estate agent was like 65. Yeah. And it was it was a job that people took to retire, and they and and I was selling investments because the market crashed. So, mm-hmm. and and I my story is that I recognized that investors were the only ones buying. So I had to learn the investment side of real estate really really fast. What year um, was that? That was for you. It was it was two thousand six okay. when I started. I was going to say, so yeah, I was like, I was not far off of that. I was right around when the big, like I, I started in 2008. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, Rockford, so I know what you mean. Yeah. 2006 is when I started. I had it like 18 months of like pretty good, you know, tr- uh, momentum and then nothing. Yeah. And that's when the learning really started to happen for me. And uh, what I did is I said, okay, education is the key as well. So I had that same kind of aha. And maybe that's what you mean by compartmentalizing that time in your life where you're just like, I'm going to compartmentalize this as a time to learn and let that, you know, cream rises to the top, you know, time will either expose you or it will promote you. And it seems like that it is promoting you. But I realized that I showed up to work in a tie and um, because I had to fool people into thinking I was professional Yeah, because it's a perception based industry sales is really any, especially real estate. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, then I realized I didn't want to live that way anymore. I just didn't want to live that way because it didn't feel authentic to me because I wouldn't normally wear a tie, you know? Um, And I felt like I was faking it. And I don't know if you know much about like the Enneagram, um, but I'm a three on the Enneagram scale, which is like a a salesman type. And I always felt like I was um, faking it in front of people because I would always kind of change my personality to meet the way the person was acting, you know, um, like if they were boisterous, I would be more boisterous. And I always felt fake by doing it. I always felt like I wasn't really respecting them or I I wasn't being true to myself. But what I found over time was that I was actually honoring that person by making them feel more comfortable. And it was a natural thing that I did. And I didn't even realize that I was doing it until my wife who's incredibly intelligent told me she's like no this is what you're doing so i really admire what you did in your 20s and i admire that part of your journey because it's not easy at all and you know going and i just really love the way that you approach that by learning and so when you say you kind of had to you know fool people into thinking you were professional i get that i've done that and it's not easy And the thing is like, here, here's a, here's a reframe that I'd like to give you. Um, because that's what everything is. We are complex human beings. Even when I was that age and I was trying to convince people, 
I did have the grit. I was probably actually even better than some of the people who were double my age because for whatever reason, I was more professional. I was trying to be more professional. I wanted to be more professional, which is what made me more, more professional. Now, here's the reality. People like to work with others and be around others that they know, like, and trust. So when you were saying that when somebody was more boisterous, you would also be more boisterous, but you didn't feel authentic to yourself. What I want you to think about is the fact that we as human beings are complex creatures. There are so many sides to us that we don't even realize are inside of us. One of the biggest learning lessons is actually getting to know ourselves, learning who we actually are. Like every day I put effort into learning about myself and I still don't even know. Like I I know a minuscule about myself. I literally have a, um, on my phone, I have a document called Opinions I Didn't Know I Had because I want to write a book out of it. That's great. We have opinions about absolutely everything. We just mm. don't know we have it yet. Just like we have aspects of our entire, like everything that makes us up are just aspects of things. So while you were being boisterous and it didn't feel authentic to you, I'm willing to bet that if you talk to anybody throughout your life before that moment that knew you, they would probably be able to pinpoint a time when you were also boisterous to some degree in a given situation. And it's because we're chameleons. We naturally tend to, to not change in a bad way, but to adapt to different situations because that's how we survive. You have to adapt, you adopt and you adapt to survive. So when you are with somebody and you begin adopting because you've adapted to how they're acting, you're actually creating rapport, which is a fundamental foundation of creating a relationship where they know, like, and trust you. The more that you have the rapport, the more they feel like they know you. And the more that they feel like they know you, and the more alike you are with them, the more that they'll like you. Because really, most people feel most comfortable with somebody who is similar to them, unless they've got a really, you know, um, difficult personality. You feel most comfortable with people who are similar to you because you don't have to try to create conversation. It flows naturally. So I think it's That's really true. important to kind of think about it. You are really multifaceted. So whatever ends up being something that you're matching and mirroring with somebody is still authentic to you as long as you are mindfully being authentic. You know, like sometimes people will start adapting language that they would never use and it sounds really weird coming from them. Sure. I never suggest that. But the attitude, the idea, and as long as it is, you know, within your value as well is important. So let's talk about reframing for the benefit of people that don't know what that is. And, um, you know, in in uh, my, the intro that I have given you for this particular podcast, I mean, we're talking, we're introducing you as who you are, which is an entrepreneur. You are a business coach. You are a sales coach. You are a student of the human experience. And so reframing is a technique that I use a lot, especially when parenting or yeah. when coaching uh, salespeople that maybe did not get the result that they wanted. So talk about reframing, what it is, and how it's so effective. So reframing is key in every aspect of life. It's it's something like I love that you mentioned about your kids, because I do it with my kids all the time. Here's an example that I can give. I have had a career as an entrepreneur where I have seen more failures than success. Okay. Now, failure is something that's a really difficult pill to swallow. You put your heart and soul into certain things and then for it to not work out and not be successful is really, really hard. So reframing fundamentally when you're especially coming out of something that didn't work out is key. For everything that I've ever been through, I automatically am trying to reframe right away as to, okay, what did I learn from this experience? How do I reuse this experience? How can I grow from it? What can I use to navigate a different path? How can I create a new opportunity out of this? So I'll give you a little bit about my history. Um, 
So when I when I navigated out of being a stockbroker, I decided I wanted to stay in the finance space, but I wanted to go into alternative. And so I became mortgage licensed. I did alternative investments and I was doing a lot of capital raising as well. I was doing really good. I actually well, what kind of projects. Uh, so real estate projects, so a lot of real estate projects. Okay. And then I was also doing some alternative ones. So when the cannabis space started to erupt in Canada, pre-legalization, mm -hmm. I did a lot of capital raising for that as well. So I participated pretty heavily. Now I was, I had done such a large amount of work in trying to become a good salesperson. And I was also really authentic. The core reason why I wanted to go into finance is because I remember when I was young, my parents, I there's a, a broker who they had been having handled their money. He lost all of it. Oh, um, no. All of our all of our RESP savings, a large portion of their RESP savings. Like I just remember Is that like retirement savings? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Canada's retirement. Okay. I remember them just being devastated by mm. it. And so I, the whole reason why I got into the finance space was twofold. One, I wanted to be able to take care of my parents because I didn't want them to ever be taken advantage of by someone like that again, because this, the guy ended up being not great of a guy. And then also I wanted to be able to protect family and friends and help them make money. I wanted them, I wanted to be a person who changed their lives in a positive way. So that's why I went into the finance space is I wanted to be able to guide them to help them because you know you think about it, one of the most intimate relationships in your life is the person who handles your money, the person who's buying or selling your home, and your spouse. So those are like the top three relationships that you tend to have and doctors as well. And maybe a dentist. I mean they have their fingers in your mouth. This that's pretty true. intimate, you know, but that that's pretty get, true. Yeah. <laughs> so these are people that like are really embedded in your life. And yeah. so I wanted to be somebody that was going to do right by people. And that was always the foundation of my business is I wanted to do right by people. Hmm. Here's where the big reframe comes in. So I was, I had worked so hard. Like I hustled really hard. I listened to every sales business course, teacher, coach. I spent one year, I spent $40,000 in coaching alone. Come on. Build, oh Yeah to build my business. Like I, any sales, wow. business, any sales coaching you can think of, I've done, like I did it. So I was doing really well. I actually mm. ended up becoming like the in office financial person for five real estate brokerages. Like I was doing good. And these people trusted me and I had like a literal relationship with them, friend relationship. I went to funerals. I went to weddings. I went to birthdays. I called these people like it was a friendship. Hmm. Built it up, going really well, making really great money, thriving, felt great about everything. Until one day, everything came crashing down. Hmm. Now, let me pre-frame this for you. I had no idea what was happening. I had no idea that there was any, you know, so the products that we sold in the alternative space were represented by different companies. And each company in Canada, there's certain... What's, what's an example like of a, of a product that you were selling at the time? So uh, at the time it was syndicate mortgages was okay. one of the primary things. Now, if you look up syndicate mortgages in Canada, you're, you're probably going to see the company that I am specifically talking about because it is literally one of the largest fraud cases in oh, Canada's wow. history. Wow. It was crazy. So, but this company was a legitimate company. They had really good track record. Like mm. they had 28 successful projects where clients were bringing in between eight to 14% annualized rate of return. So I was promoting it and I was selling it with the investors. And I had like, it was the dream. Like it was, it was so wonderful. And so it was 2017. I had just found out I was pregnant. The world came, like I was literally planning with um, one of the real estate brokerage owners, how I was going to do an expansion because I specialize in corporate on life insurance and how to structure it as a tax mitigation tool and investment tool, as well as a living benefit. So right. I had pitched this, I was teaching it. I was going to roll it out with the brokerage. It was going to be like a really great tool. So forth. Everything was like sunshine and butterflies. Yeah. Literally, that was on a Thursday. 
That was the Thursday night. Friday morning, I get a phone call. Actually, I didn't know I was pregnant yet. The, the, I didn't know I was quite pregnant yet, but I get a phone call. Somebody asks me, why is the RCMP in this company, this named company? I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, yeah, the RCMP is raiding them. I'm like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Is that about? like the SEC? Yeah. Like, okay. like it was huge. I'm like, what? And it was like, so the RCMP is kind of like the SEC, but it's, um, it's literally like the police, like it's the Mounties. Okay. Here they and, come, like with the hats and all they're yeah. in there. The yeah. Well, without tall, the hats, but yeah. The tall people and, yeah. and the, and the, the stern looks, right. Exactly. They're, they're in the building where you are employed, right. Because we were independent salespeople, we were all over, but the actual building where like they did everything was there. Oh, wow. I'm like, oh my God, what are you talking about? And then months, the next months were horrific. There was, it was massive fraud. There was a lot of like, there was a lot of mismanagement, misappropriation of money. It was just, there was so many bad things. Anyone who's interested can go and look it up, but it was horrible my business came crashing down because after that phone call, I got the next phone call from the brokerage owner, severing all ties with me. Absolutely all ties with me. My business dissolved within hours. So I lost everything. And so help then me, help me understand though. So uh, this is a fascinating story and thank you for sharing it. So, so did you bring clients then to investments that were then managed by a fraudulent company? So yes. So there's this additional maybe feeling of responsibility, not that it was, but you, people that trusted you with their money are now having to go through a process to recover it. Um, when you say that the broker owner severed ties with you, was that just something that they were having to do with everybody um, as like an employment or was this a third party that was like mad at you for some reason? So it was the broker owner was a third party. So he was the owner of the real estate brokerages that I'd been okay. in. Okay. Gotcha. And so obviously his relationship with me and what was happening was negative for you him. You were pulled in probably to the reputation of the things that were happening at the company that you worked for, even though you weren't, you weren't a bad so person. Down, yeah. I was so far down the totem pole. I didn't know what was going on. Right. But I had raised a lot of money. I had raised mm. $11 million for them. Mm. Mm. Now, not all $11 million was lost, but I'm talking like parents, my parents, family my sister like mm -hmm. me personally i lost i lost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in it and again yeah. i wasn't that old at the time that was everything yeah. we asked for oh it's a lot it was horrific my husband like i i had it we invested together like he Correct. trusted me everybody who had trusted me with their life savings was being washed away including my own hmm. that's when the reframe happened i was it took a lot in me. Like I, I, it, it was because I am, I am a very empathetic person and literally like my clients became my friends because I cared so much. It was horrible. I just, I remember, like, I remember back then I was having, I was doing so many lawyer calls because all of my clients, like they, obviously we were handling it, trying to like navigate and direct and it's still not resolved. It's still not all resolved. They're up for their charges this year. It was a really rocky go and I was struggling. When you say you lost everything, do you mean you couldn't pay rent anymore or- well well, this is where the story gets even funner. Oh my gosh. Um, so it wasn't that we couldn't pay rent because I was very good with our money. Um, and I was also very lucky that my husband has a family business. So we had a safety net. Okay. So there smart. was a certain safety net, but I lot like my business literally shut down. I had, I had no more network because anybody like, could you imagine me going out and trying to raise money after I just like potentially all of my clients lost all this money? Number one, they don't have money to invest. Number two, are they going to do it with me again? Right. What a red mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, colleague relationships, like all of the brokerage relationships that I mm. work to get in and work with me. You know, and the reason why I went the insurance route and why I still do insurance is because you can't damage people with insurance. Insurance, you know, it's a necessary thing. People need it, but it's also really good when structured the right way. I can't do damage with insurance. So that's why I went that route. Okay. I literally all of that, my business, um, the partnerships that I was in, all of the business relationships and a lot of personal relationships. I lost so many friends at that time. 
I was, and, and I didn't know what I was going to do next. I had no direction. Cause I was like, I can't ever do investments. I don't ever want to do investments again. I don't like, I never want to be the responsibility of somebody losing money again. I was just broken. I was, can we, can we talk a little bit about the day to day? Like, if you don't mind going back to that, to yeah. those moments, like waking up and just thinking about what are you going to do today? Now, knowing you better now, having had a conversation with you, I know that you were able to reframe it and pull yourself out. And I want to talk about that. Yeah. But in that, in those moments where you just felt lost, like talk about what the days were like for you. Oh my gosh. So I wouldn't be sleeping. I couldn't sleep at night. And every day consisted of me needing to call clients and tell them what was happening and then needing to book the lawyer calls with them. Or And, and you were probably in your first trimester then at this point too. Yeah. And I was only just finding out. So I had just wow. found out I was pregnant and we literally, I was on like that day. So this is where the story gets really, really funny. So I'm struggling to get up every day and every day is consisting of me telling clients bad news, having people like wanting to attack me and like right. tell me I'm a horrible person. So having to field people literally telling me I ruined their lives wow. and just, and feeling it, feeling the weight of it, and then having to get on the next phone call to do the same thing. Because I picked up the phone. I was the one, a lot of brokers disappeared, but I picked up the phone calls from people to the point that I was picking up phone calls from other agents, clients, and talking to them. So I was fielding it all and I was absorbing it all. And it was horrible. And I was having trouble. I was having trouble eating. I was having trouble, like even thinking straight. I couldn't sleep. I was at the rock bottom. I was so depressed and I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea where I was going to go. I didn't know if I needed to get a job at McDonald's. I didn't know like anything. I was so broken as an individual. And then found out I was pregnant. And what's the, what's the name of your first child? Theo. His name is Theo. And he is like, oh my God, this child, he really is like, he is, I know every parent is like, oh, my child is fantastic. But like, He's special. Aria, my daughter, is also very, very special too. But like, he represents resilience to me as well. And he is, he is very much my own personality as well. Like, he's extremely empathetic, very loving, all of that stuff. So well, he was, he was born in, in war, right? He us. was born in conquest. So, yeah. you know, I'm surprised you didn't name him Conan or something. The, the, Theo, the, the conqueror. That's cool. The so, so I'm with you. I'm I'm feeling yeah. the pain with you. Yeah. So um, I can't imagine what those days were like because I also absorb all of that energy and I absorb all of that responsibility. Yeah. Um, th that's why I truly wanted to master real estate investing because all of my I mean, my, my grandparents were my first private equity lenders and, yeah. you know, then my parents and their friends. And then, um, from then on, it's other people trusting you with their money. And it's, it means a lot to me. And it's always been difficult for me to see how cavalier people are with other people's money, but I, I have a really hard time doing that. And sure. so I've got to know that I know that I know that it's a good investment, that it is going to work out. But you just, you, I mean, COVID can hit. I was in the middle of building a nine bedroom short-term rental when all of a sudden worldwide tourism stopped. And I didn't know if I should still make the payments on this loan. Cause I felt, well, I was going to, if I was going to lose the house or if, you know, I needed to spend, it was going to cost a hundred thousand dollars to furnish this place, to get it ready for the market. But there was no market global tourism had shut down. So it's like, what do you do in these moments? And so here you are in these moments of complete indecision how did you begin to build your way out? So literally after we found out we were pregnant with Theo, um, my house fell apart. So we had a rental basement and literally I was on the phone with the lawyers. My parents were in the house with me and we were talking about what was happening. My tenant comes upstairs. There's water running down the walls. Mm. I'm like, <laughs> go downstairs. No way septic pump back up. So oh it gosh. came in through the house and started filling the bulkheads and took it throughout the entire basement and flooded the basement with sewage. Oh like I'm talking God. sewage running down the walls. 
sewage coming up from the ground. And then because we had had weather here, we had had a uh, three days of rain, a freeze, and then a massive thaw. And that's what caused this whole problem. Mm -hmm. I'm freshly pregnant and I am literally shot vacuuming this water. Oh it was gosh. horrible. So then we had to gut the basement. And as we were gutting the basement, we then found that, oh, by the way, our foundation has a crack in it. So then we had to bury out the house so that we could have the foundation fixed. And then as we were doing all of that, we we're like, okay, well, we might as well, because the septic system failed to put in a new septic system, we're going to have to pay a lot of money. We're the last possible hookup for the town. So let's bite the bullet and hook into the town. So then as we're starting to do that, we chisel into the ground and we find, oh, there's like a foot and a half of eroded soil underneath our foundation. We now need to take up the entire basement's foundation, dig down, and then, you know, report $100,000 later. Oh, my. Of renovations. And keep in mind, I was pregnant. So now at this point, I'm still, I'm getting more pregnant. I don't know what I'm going to do in business. I'm still dealing with people calling me daily, telling me I'm a horrible person and trying to navigate how to protect these people as much as possible or salvage anything that we could. My house has fallen apart and I'm not feeling great as a pregnant person. But my midwives kept telling me, oh, it's your first time being pregnant. Pregnant isn't comfortable. Well, what actually turns out is I had kidney stones. Oh, and, no. Uh-huh. I literally ended up in the hospital eight months pregnant. I ended up in the hospital for three weeks straight. And because they couldn't do the imaging to identify specifically what it was, they didn't know exactly what was going on. It took five doctors to finally say, you have kidney stones. When they finally did the operation and keep in mind, my house is disheveled at this point. Like we have a bungalow, our basement, like when you walked in the front door, you could see right down, there was no stairs downstairs anymore either. You could see right down to a dirt floor. My driveway was ripped up because they were laying the pipe down to the hookup. There was a, there was a trench around my house that literally got coined. Um, we had to do a ramp to the front door. It literally got coined the ramp of death because had you have fallen off that ramp, you'd be falling down about an eight foot drop. Wow. Everything was an absolute mess. Now, during my whole journey, all of the sales courses that I take, that's when I, I had taken NLP. So I took NLP, neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis in 2012, 13, 14, 15. So I had, I actually am a trainer of trainers. So I'm the highest level of training. And I literally started needing to lean on that because I was falling apart mentally, physically, emotionally. My house was falling apart. Everything was falling apart. And that, that slush fund that we had, that I was like, oh, we've got money. I've got time to decide and rebuild from here. Oh, that was getting used up for the house. Hmm. So I had to. I had to, because everything was on the line. My life had fallen apart and I was pregnant with a baby. And I'm like, I have to figure this out. So I started focusing and deciding what I was going to do. And that's when I decided about insurance because you can't do any harm with insurance. That's when I really started focusing on that and also building out. So because I worked so heavily with real estate agents, like that was my primary clientele base. I started rebuilding with them and putting in tax mitigation strategies and, and group insurance, like doing all of the things that real estate agents really do need as part of their foundation. Realizing what their specific financial needs were in their businesses. Okay. Exactly. And then I started rebuilding from there and it was slow and steady. But as I was doing that, because I was really using all of the tools that I needed to use, like with NLP, I honestly will say NLP was a huge factor as to why I was able to be mentally resilient. Because when I was learning to become a coach during like everything that had happened before, when, every, when life was great, when I was learning to become a coach, I was learning how to reframe. I was learning what it took to be mentally resilient. I was learning how to lean on all of the modalities that I had learned to implement. And I had learned them to use on others, to coach others, but I ended up using it on myself. And I have to say, if I had not had those in place, I don't think that I would have ever gotten through what I did because so I ended up- Let's talk about NLP for a minute because 
some people know what it is and some people may not. So neuro linguistic programming, yeah. um, it was founded in the right, right around the 1970s by yeah. a guy named John Grinder and, um, Richard Bailey. Yeah. And, um, it was, a, they were studying geniuses, weren't they? Yes. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about that and then, and then how you use those to pull yourself up. Yes. So neurolinguistics programming's foundation is about how we communicate externally with what is happening internally. So the way that our brain is made up is um, think of us like a computer. So we have um, we have neural pathways, we have neurotransmitters where information is created and then sent over to another part of our brain and processed. All of the information that we are absorbing externally comes into our brains and is then filtered through. And that's how we understand what's happening. So we have something called the model of the world. Depending on what your representational system is, so you might be visual, you might be auditory, you might be kinesthetic. So those are the three primary ones. Meaning you process the world visually or yeah. more through you know things you hear or more things that you touch and feel. Exactly. Okay. Now, a large portion of the population is visually centric. So we take in everything that we see. There's also another portion that is very um, sound centric. So auditorily, and then the kinesthetic is the feel of everything. So this is how we take in our world. And then we process it. So, you know, the saying that I put people out at a sunset and ask them to describe it, they'll all describe it differently. Mm -hmm. It's because the way that we all process our model of the world is very differently or very different from each other. Now, when we take in that information, it then runs through a program. Absolutely everything we do in life has a program to it. The way that you wake up in the morning and turn off your alarm on your phone, if you have an alarm, the way that you make your coffee, the way you turn on your car, absolutely everything you do in life is an innate program that's embedded in you that you just run. And the reason why we are all programs that we're running is because it has an expected outcome. You know, so much of our lives are busy. We have to make choices. When we're able to just go into an autopilot program, we know what the outcome is going to be so we can just do it and not have to use the mental capacity. Mm -hmm. Because at any given moment, we are bombarded with about 2 million bits of information per second that's coming to us visually, auditorily, and kinesthetically. So because of that, we naturally delete, distort, and generalize the information. So you know the saying that we only use 10% of our brain? We actually use 100% of our brain. It's just being used at different points in time in different ways. And we're only consciously recognizing a small portion of what we're being bombarded with. Hmm. So with NLP, Richard Bandler and John Grimler recognized that in all of their studies of you know, geniuses, they were also studying hypnosis and all of the great minds behind hypnosis, um, Milton, everybody, Virginia Satire, they were studying those people. And then they were also studying different studies that had to do with how our brains process through those neurotransmitters and, and basically took the outside world, processed it internally, and then what we actually thought about what we were experiencing. And from there, they came out with a number of different techniques that can be used to harness your brain power, to be able to control your emotional psyche. And I apologize, my Roomba has just come into my kitchen. Bear with me one oh, second. Exciting. Turn it off. So sorry about that. You know, I've always been afraid to use a Roomba because I've heard horror stories of them like one you know uh do you like it so okay i love my roomba i love it because i do have a dog and a cat and it does take care of a lot but remember earlier when i told you that i was once told that if i didn't have bad luck i'd have no luck <laughs> i have i have i've had a, a taste of that in this interview with you yes. <laughs> i can see that yeah it's always like a comedic thing to it too so mother's day um I go out, we have to stop back at home. I'm going to go shopping with my kids and my mom and my sister. I stop back at home just for a moment because my little girl needs different shoes. 
mm-hmm. and I come in the house and I'm like, what is that smell? Oh, it no. was horrific. Roomba, my dog, had had a sick stomach. And Roomba. That's the horror story that I was talking about. No, this did not happen to you. On Mother's Day. And she took it all over the house because I've got a bungalow. She took it into my son's bedroom. And I'm talking on the walls because it's got a spinner. So horrific. And then it was so, it was so full. I honestly, I thought about getting rid of it. I'm like, this thing's just like, it's so full of poop. I'm going to just, it's got to go. But I literally, I I put on the gloves and I cleaned it out. Eventually it was okay in the end. The whole Um, house. You just had to clean the whole house. Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. So anyways, yeah, I know the experience. I've done it. I've had it. You still have a Roomba. I do. I know it's like I didn't learn my lesson. But so, no. but but what great courage you have! I mean, <laughs> you're not afraid of that because you've already done it, right? So yeah. big deal. The I the benefit figured. of having all the hair and everything picked up far outweighs the trauma of going through that again. Right. For you. Right. You're like, you're I, an incredibly brave person, Colleen. Resilient. Truly brave resilient. and resilient. Yes. Exactly. So, so let's yeah. talk about. Um, a little bit about how we would use this um, NLP techniques when you're coaching salespeople or professionals, because this is a lot of what you do now, um, coaching and taking your experience in the human condition and sales, um, you know, powerful sales tactics and, uh, you know, results. And how, how would you use some of these principles to help somebody in sales Perfect question. So there is always in in all of the coaching that I do, there's always two main areas of trouble that everyone has experienced, the hurdles that they're experienced. One of them is their own personal belief systems or limiting beliefs that are preventing them from achieving the success that they deserve. And the other one is not having all of the tools to communicate and be able to convert potential prospects into actual clients and closed deals. Those are the two fundamental issues that people run into. And then there's a plethora of reasons that feed into both of them. So right now we're experiencing a pretty difficult market. Everybody is struggling. We've got real estate agents who really just don't know what to do in life. And we've got ones who are considering whether they should continue going forward in the industry or change paths. Well, let's got- for, for people that don't know the industry that are listening, let's talk about that for a little bit because you know, the available inventory on the market right now is as low as it was in 2008. Yeah. Because people do not right now want to get out of their interest rates that are three or 4% and selectively move to a home that and pay an eight or 9% interest rate. They just don't want to do it. You know, inflation has caused the value of our do- respective dollars to go down. So there's really our buying power is less, our disposable income is less. And therefore, people just aren't moving. Now, real estate is a need-based asset. People die. People get married. People have babies. And that those people are going to move regardless. Yes. There's divorces, right? There's things that happen that cause people to need to move or people to liquidate an asset. But for the most part, people aren't just going to say, hey, I'm going to move. They're going to wait. They're going to postpone that decision because of the market conditions. Now, that trickles down to real estate agents in in the form of lower production or having to compete more for every client. So, you know, with that knowledge for our listeners, keep going. It's really hard because to be successful in anything, but especially a competitive industry for all of the reasons you mentioned, somebody has to be aligned internally meaning their their mental psyche and how they feel to be successful externally. Because when we were going back and we were talking about all the struggles that I had gone through, during that time, I was so down and so out that trying to even think about prospecting would have been just not even in the question. Exactly. Thinking, who's, yeah. Who's got the confidence to try exactly. to knock on a door when you're like, gee, well, exactly. you know, my results are this that I'm living in, how could I expect it to be any different for somebody else? You know, what a horrible question to ask yourself. Exactly. And that's where, that's where one of the first areas that I start working with clients on is 
getting them mentally aligned. Okay. You know, I've had clients who have limiting beliefs that are imposed on them from when they were very small children to clients that, you know, a year and a half ago had a really bad experience with a client that has now really jaded them and now they're having a crisis of confidence. There's so many different reasons why we have these mental barriers and hurdles that affect us and tell us, I can't do this. I don't deserve this. Can I actually achieve it? These limiting beliefs. So I start off by finding out the core root of that and then building them back up to believe that they can do it, to know that they can do it, not just believe, but to know that they can do it. Because listen, I am a believer. You can do anything. I mean, there's certain limitations. Obviously, you know, me being a Canadian, I'm, I'm, if I was to be like, oh, I want to become the next female president of the U.S., not going to happen. I'm Canadian. Like, there's a lot of factors that prevent me from being able to do that. But me becoming the next top coach within the next five years that's internationally sought out, absolutely, that can definitely happen. Yeah. And you being the top, Um, real estate agent or real estate brokerage in your area, that absolutely can happen. Mm -hmm. Anything can happen. You just have to have your path. So I start off by helping the person understand who they are, why they have that issue, then helping build them back up and believe that they can achieve it and know that they can achieve it. And helping them be able to create and use all the tools. Because let me tell you something. Motivation is complete BS. Do you know when motivation hits us most? When we're lying in bed at 12 o'clock at night and we're like, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. I'm going to work out. I'm going to do all of these things before 7 a.m. And I'm going to have a great productive day. And then 5 a.m. rolls around and the alarm goes off and you're like, "Mm, but it's warm in bed. And I don't really, I didn't get anything ready for workout. I don't even know what I should do to work out. And it's negative two outside because it's Canada. So exactly. So (laughs) we tend to, you know, if you don't, if you plan, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So this happens. This is why motivation is complete BS. But what I do is I teach them, here are tools to leverage, to use, to create your own pushing force behind you. Because motivation isn't going to be there. You're going to wing. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. So you need to have tools and strategies and programs, neuro-linguistic programming. So I teach them about implementing programs, rituals, so that they are staying on track. And then because of all of my business experience and all of my areas of specialty, finance, social media, marketing and advertising, we then address the business. So literally every every client is individual. Every client has their own specific hurdles and things that they've tried that didn't work and things that they don't feel comfortable doing that we need to navigate and figure out a different solution for we then solution their business because they create goals. So I have all of the clients create the goals that they want to achieve. And when I have clients in my actual coaching programs, my my coin phrase is I drag dead bodies over finish lines. When I'm working with somebody, I guarantee their success to achieve that goal because I'm going to make them do it. They're going to do it. And they're going to do it in an empowered and positive way. And they're going to grow along the way because they're going to be accountable. So let's what? talk about that. You drag dead bodies. Sorry, I'm a nerd. And we have to talk about that now. No, you drag dead bodies over finish lines. I like the yeah. phrase. It's attention getting. Yeah. Um, so it seems what I'm thinking you mean mm-hmm. is that you're taking somebody that has lost all motivation or desire to, you know, succeed. But for some reason, they've hired you as a coach. Yeah. So they're, they, they do believe there is some hope. Yeah. Um, and you... At what point do they become resurrected? Um, after they get across the finish line, after the, after there's like a belief or a win, you help them get to their first win and then they kind of come alive and learn to walk on their own again. Talk to me a little bit about what you mean by that. Usually after their first session is when they start to get resurrected. Okay. Most people, once they understand why they feel hopeless, mm-hmm. why they feel limited and where it came from, we can literally peel it back and show them how it's not correct. So I do things like timeline therapy. Um, I do belief change exercises. I help people peel back where that belief came from and reframe it to an empowering belief. Use me for an example, okay? I went through everything that I went through 
And one of my biggest limiting beliefs was how can anybody ever trust me? How, how did can you anybody the, how ever did you answer the question? So I did a lot of self-work and then I recognized I'm an authentically good person. I genuinely do want people to do well. Like when somebody is thriving and getting what they want and achieving goals, it completely, it's like it fills my cup. Like I genuinely thrive off of other people achieving too, because it's so wonderful to see people make, like getting what they want and that happiness of achieving it. So in that time, I had to reframe why would anybody trust me to, you know, why somebody will trust me? Because I've been through hell and back and I made it out and I still want to help people. You know why people will trust me? Because I know what it's like to be at the bottom and I know what it's like to build back up. You know why people will trust me? Because I'm so invested in somebody's success that I will pour all of my efforts into making them achieve it. That's why someone will trust me. So I reframed it all. I reframed it because when I peeled back all of the guilt, all of the shame, everything that had happened, I still at my core wanted good for other people. So that's why people will trust me. I That's beautiful. I have done that for myself and for other people. And when I have somebody sitting in front of me that's just spouting out lies about themselves, you know, I can tell their lies, but they can't tell their lies. It's how they feel. So for them, it's real. Yeah. And I just ask them to write all those lies down. Just yeah. write down every lie that you're saying right now. Just write them all down. And I'm calling them lies mm -hmm. because they are. But they are. for you, they're real. So you just we're just going to write these down. And then on the left-hand side of that, I want you to write these words. I refuse to buy in to the false belief that, and then their words are there. Yeah. And then on the right-hand side of that, we write the word because the truth is blank. And then you have to rewrite that yes. lie in a form of a truth. Yep. It's an empowering statement then. That's amazing. That's, that's a that's a pure NLP technique. That's amazing. Is it? That's beautiful. So I I, um, I want to give people kind of a really um, nugget that they can walk away with. So let me mm -hmm. let me put you to, to the test here. So because yeah. um, I know you can handle it. Yeah. So overcoming indecision, right? So we have a lot of clients right now that are kind of in a fear based scenario where they want to make a move or they don't want to make a move, there's a lot of indecision in their personal or professional life. How do you help somebody deal with indecision? Or how do you help, how do you coach a salesperson who's working with a client who has indecision? So one of the powerful techniques that I love to use when somebody is in an indecisive point, because everybody's there all the time, I have them future pace, which is where I have them envision what their future is going to be like if they don't make a decision, have them envision what their future will be like if the decision doesn't work out and does work out. Okay. So, you say, and this is called future place, you said? Future pacing. Future pacing. Gotcha. Okay. So by simply envisioning what the worst case scenario is and then talking through if that's actual reality, because oftentimes people are paralyzed because they're so fixated on that worst case scenario. So talking through that first and saying, okay, what is the actual worst case scenario? What, what could really happen? So let's say that somebody, okay, let's use, let's use defaults as an example because we're experiencing record defaults happening in Canada. It's really starting to trend upwards, which is a scary thing. So let's say that you're working with a client who has not yet defaulted, but they're feeling the tightness and they're starting to think about whether or not they should be selling their home. And they're really sitting on the fence. So they're in that, and are they're in the analysis paralysis or the indecision. So they're sitting there. So I'd say to them, okay, let's talk this through. Because right now you are in the power position. You still have control over your situation. I know that it feels like you're losing control, but today you have control. So let's think about our situation. So what is the worst case scenario if you were to decide to do nothing at all right now? What would happen? Well, I can't afford the payments, so eventually I'm going to go into default. And when I go into the default, then they're going to force me to sell my home under duress. And when they force me to sell my home under duress, there's all different scenarios that can take place. Like, I've literally heard heartbreaking stories of, like, single parents, their home's in default. They are undergoing medical issues themselves. Their children are, you know, being displaced. And they're, like, having to sell their house, like, mm -hmm. as a, Okay. 
that's a horrible situation. So like that's catastrophizing the situation. So you talk about them, worst case scenario. Now what's worst case scenario if you were to take control today and you were to put your heads up on the market? I really don't want to move. I really like my home, you know, uprooting my family and everything. But what's the worst case scenario? Like talk that out and you keep having them talk it out and you keep reframing that in a positive way. What's what's the best case scenario if we do take action today and we decide that we're going to list next week? Well, then I'm able to control my situation. I'm able to stage my house well enough so that it can get the top dollar. I'm able to buy myself some time before mortgage default comes so that I can also find a new place to move and not be under duress then. It's all about empowering them to make the decision and walking them through each of the scenario. Worst case scenario, if you don't make a decision. Worst case scenario, if you make the wrong decision. Worst case scenario, if you make the right decision. And reframing it all for them so that they can feel like they have the control that they're currently lacking. Does this work on all people or only people that tend to kind of move away from pain, you know, in their sort of general, like people either move away from pain or move towards pleasure. It's mm -hmm. It seems like most people move away from pain. There's so maybe that's just a great blanket tactic to work on a, a yeah. large percentage of the population. It, it works. This is a tactic that will work on everybody because okay. you can very easily change it. So I was giving that negative scenario. What's the worst case, worst case, worst case, mm -hmm. but you could do, okay, what's the worst case if we don't make a decision? What's the worst case if we make the wrong decision? What's the best case scenario here? You know, you can do the negatives versus the positives, the pros mm -hmm. and cons. Because if you do have somebody who is the move towards positive, and you are right, there are a few people, like there's a small group of people that are more, more influenced by going towards a positive, but the majority of the population is influenced to get away from the negative, to avoid the negative. And that's just right. like a caveman thing that is ingrained in us. But it works like that. That specific tactic works on everybody. It's all about the way you reframe it. That's the only caveat that changes is the way you reframe it for the person. So with some successful okay. reframing, it's like you are uncovering something for them. And people are scared. If we think about the world in general, one of the biggest reasons when the world turns to chaos is fear. You get people that monger up the fear and then the world starts going a little bit crazy because they're afraid. So helping to calm someone's fear, not only does that help you close the sale, but that also helps you create a lasting relationship. Like if you are able to take somebody from a fear scenario and give them comfort and then guide them towards the positive, they'll remember you. And they'll want other people to feel that too. Because regardless, even in a perfect scenario, buying or selling a home is a scary thing. There's so many things that could go sideways. And, you know, having somebody who is really in your corner protecting you, it means the world of difference. It's true. And you, having been through so much, mm -hmm. um, are so powerful because it's like, who do you want to operate on your heart? The heart surgeon that's never had anything happen and everything's always gone right or the person that's learned a few things, the person that has been in, in the mix and operated well under pressure. Mm -hmm. So, or have learned to function under pressure even, you know, uh, that's that's the first skill set. you know, function under pressure and then excel under pressure. So is, I'm glad to to get to know you because I think we can have more conversations in the future. And I would love to bring uh, topics to you in the future, have you back on the show. I think you're a phenomenal person. Is there anything else that you just want to get across on this uh, that you just want to tell people? Anything else? Yeah. I know that a lot of people are really nervous about the world in general today. And, you know, especially in the real estate space, what what's going to happen in the future and in the market? What I want you to know is that with the right tools, the right resources, you can thrive even in a downward market. I know people when we were talking about when we both were in the industries and, and starting off in professional careers, I started as a stockbroker in 2008, like we were facing the market crashes and I still was doing well. You can thrive. Anyone can thrive in different 
circumstances, you know, in the 1930s, when we were in the Great Depression, that's when the most amount of wealth was created for the wealthiest people still in this world. So don't discount yourself based on what's happening from a global level. All you need to do is believe in yourself and then figure out the tools and the programs that you need to run to get there. Success is just a program. I can honestly tell you that every day I wake up and on my good days and on my bad days, they're all the same type of strategy I take that day. Uh, Today is a program. Here's what I need to do and the steps I need to take to get towards my goal. And that's what you got to do too. You're right. I agree wholeheartedly. It was then that 2008, you know, time frame that I discovered my pathway for short-term rentals and began to guide a lot of people into that asset class and help build a lot of wealth for a lot of people. And now, even as that industry continues to pivot, and some people say it is, um, you know, done. Some people say it's uh, oversaturated. You know, to that I say, what metrics are you using? What mm-hmm. data are you using? And when we are able to use data and context together, we're able to process that through our experiences and produce something that is actionable, not only for ourselves but for other people. And I found. The, one of the most true statements I could possibly make is that not everyone needs advice, but everyone needs encouragement. Yes. So thank you for providing both to people. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoy your Instagram channel, Transcending Minds. And I encourage everybody to go there to consume all of Colleen McKay's wisdom and just great personality. So thank you for being a light in the world. And I look forward to getting to know you better. And thanks so much for your time today, for being on the show. Um, Tell us what's next for you and then how we can get a hold of you. Absolutely. Uh, So I am currently working on five different courses that are meant to help people with everything from limiting beliefs to how to build a sales system that is going to guarantee their success. So long as I do the steps, guarantee their success. I'm also working on two books. One is about incorporating NLP into your sales system using different language, how to connect with people on a deeply emotional level, using the different rapport channels as well. And then I've got another one that is kind of centered around finance, understanding finance and not being afraid of it and learning how to communicate based on that. Um, So those are the the big things that are coming from me. I have a big goal this year as well that I want to help over the next 12 months. I want to help a minimum of 100 people achieve their goals. So that's a big thing that I'm working towards as well with all of my coaching clients. So there's going to be a lot coming from me in the next little while. But most importantly, I want it to be an open communication platform for people to be able to support each other as well, especially as we're in such different times that we're facing and is the your instagram channel the best way for people to connect with you yeah so on instagram transcending.minds um also on tiktok transcending minds and then we've got our website transcendingminds.com where they can find out all about the different course offerings coaching offerings but most importantly if anybody my my introductory calls are completely free so if anybody ever wants to get on and do a 30 minute sales audit learning about their process and giving a couple of tips that can help them they have a limiting belief that they could use reframing anything make sure that you check out the link tree in my bio of my instagram and book a call with me because i really do love to help and i'd be more than happy to jump on a complimentary call to do just that. Okay. Well, thanks for giving us a chance to get to know you and thanks for being authentic and sharing your story. And we look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you. I look forward to it as well. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the platform you've created to be able to share. Thank you. It's not easy, as you know, but, um, and so if you're listening to this, please let us know if you, um, if you like what we're doing, because we love to hear good news. Thanks again, Colleen, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Well, a big thank you for listening to the end of our podcast. I know your time is valuable, and I hope you got a few takeaways that are going to help you get a greater return on that time. I know you will. And if you did enjoy it, I'd sure appreciate a share or a comment. Feel free to subscribe for instant access to new episodes and offers. There's also a ton of free content and ways to learn more and engage more at worldlyrealestatenetwork.com. Until then, we'll continue to bring you recipes for success and real stories from real people who, like you, are living out your divine purpose. And hey, God loves you. No matter what happens, don't give up.